Hi everyone, we're going to start. Um, so before we start, for those of you who were, who were here last week or watched online, there is an incorrect statistic. So it's not three in four women having abortions. It's one in four. And I got a wonderful email from, I know, right, right, right? Um, I got a wonderful email from Amy who, who realized what a big mistake that was and, and was up at that night. So a wonderful email. I just wanted to convey that information. So she corrected herself and it's lovely. Uh, so we are here about suicide prevention and Dr. Karen Mason was my professor last semester for ministering to women in pain. Um, I've learned a lot in the class, um, but I think Donna and Tom are going to say a little something too. So. So, uh, Dr. Mason, Karen, is uh, we, we all came at the same time at the seminary, 2006, and she comes to us, can you hear me? No, okay. So she comes to us with this really unique blend of biblical theological scholarship um, and psychological training, formal training. She worked for the state of Colorado and, and she has a real heart for God mm -hmm. and she hears God and she walks in step with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's a unique blend to have that biblical knowledge, that biblical theological understanding of God's character, both sides of the Testament and and he's the same, right? We talked about God's character being the same. And so she brings so much of that weaving. It's, it's not easy to do that. And there are not many, many people who can do that. So we're very grateful that you're here. Yeah, we are. We are. And so I want to say, too, that I, I'm so glad that you could come. But Karen is a dear friend. And uh, because we started at Gordon Connell together, it's been really fun to, for all of us to journey together at Gordon Connell and together growing um, as faculty members. We just some fun facts about Karen. She loves, she speaks French beautifully and fluently. And we had French dinners together, French soirees, those of us on faculty that all spoke French. We'd meet together and have fondue. Or, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, David Gill was a part of that. Some of you David, know David Gill. So that's a fun thing as well. Uh, Another fun fact about Karen is this, is she is a very serious student of God's word. And I say this because, so I, as you know, I teach Old Testament, but I also teach Hebrew. And Karen devoted, do you remember what you did? I was so impressed. Karen spent an entire summer sitting in my summer Hebrew class to review her Hebrew because of how much she loves the word of God and especially the Old Testament. She has an MA in, 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 from Gordon Connell, at, uh, not, not from Gordon, Denver, Denver. From, from Denver um, in Old Testament as well. So that's impressive. It was certainly impressive to me. And then the last thing I want to say is look out for her most recent book, The Essentials of Suicide Prevention, A Blueprint for Churches. And the reason I bring that up is because I was asked to read it and I endorsed it. She graciously asked me to read it to, for the sake of endorsing it. And I have endorsed it. But the reason I'm saying that to you is because it's not often that I have read a book that uh, that propelled me to action. And so Karen, after I read your book, I I was like, yes, we have this has to be implemented. And so that just speaks of how she is meeting a need, I think, uh, to energize people on this topic and the importance of the topic, not just to read about it and have statistics about it, but to be preventative and do something about it in your church. So I was like ready to go and like you know, start a program. So that's why when this all materialized, um, I was just thrilled. So that's another fun factoid about Karen. Her work is serious. She takes it seriously, but it, it is causing, it, causing us to act as well. So without further ado, Dr. Karen Mason. Thank you. Oh, oh my goodness, those are such warm introductions. So thank you, Jan. Thank you uh, to, to the petters. Oh my goodness. Uh, so uh, just wonderful to be with here with you here this evening, and uh, very excited to talk about suicide prevention. I don't get to do that every day, but that is very much my passion. So. 
uh, thanks for inviting me and, and asking me to talk about that. So uh, I think your series is on Sanctity of Life. So I want to start out talking about Sanctity of Life. And uh, first of all, I think we have to figure out, like, what is it? What are we talking about when we talk about Sanctity of Life? Because it is so important when we think about suicide prevention. So Sanctity of Life is just that life is sacred and inviolable, right? Mm -hmm. And we read in Deuteronomy 32, there's no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. So there's this sense, you know, God is the one who gives us life. God is the one who who takes life, right? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I, I love doing is research. And so one of the things, uh, I, I've asked a lot of pastors a lot of questions around suicide prevention, but I've asked pastors questions around sanctity of life. Like, what do you really mean when you talk about sanctity of life? So these are some of the things that they've said. So I have them in red. Hopefully you can... You can read that, but sanctity of life, generally speaking, is that God gives us life and God alone decides when we leave this life, right? So uh, this is what some pastors have said. They said, ending your life is going against the will of God, right? That sounds like a sanctity of life kind of a statement. Um, I really don't think that it's up to us as human beings to make the decision to take the life, right? That's that's sounds like sanctity of life as well. God desires for people to uphold and to affirm the dignity and the value of life itself. Def definitely sanctity of life. Just a couple more. Um, life is a gift from God, and God is the one who takes life. The Lord has set the days for life uh, in these particular situations. Now, Along with sanctity of life, and I don't know if you can see this, can you see that there's a side-by-side -side doctrine, okay? So sanctity of life is one of the doctrines we hear about in church, but the other one is this notion of the preservation of the natural course of life, right? So we talk about that in terms of like, let's say, physician-assisted suicide, or how do we know, medically speaking, you know, whether we should intervene or not intervene in these particular kind of situations, right? So this is a side-by-side -side doctrine when it comes to sanctity of life. So what have some pastors told us? Well, some pastors have said, you know, sanctity of life or the preservation of the natural course of life is about preserving life from conception to natural death. Right, that's what preservation of the natural course of life is. Or, you know, it's letting life continue naturally on its own, right? Or letting nature take its course, right? Mm -hmm. So preservation of the natural course of life, the side-by-side -side doctrine right along with sanctity of life. Now, one of the things, and Jen, having just been in my class, and when I wrote this slide, I was thinking, oh, Jen has heard this a million times. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that we've also found talking to pastors is that they always have to figure out how to balance out these moral objections, right? Moral objections would be, hey, sanctity of life, preservation of the natural course of life. How do we balance that out with taking care of people who are truly suffering in those moments, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have found is that pastors will always choose pastoral care, even though they feel convinced about these doctrinal pieces of sanctity of life and the preservation of the natural course of life. Mm -hmm. So here are some examples of things that they've said. They've said, it's not like you start out there. You don't start out with, hey, let's sit down and have a conversation about the sanctity of life and the preservation of the natural course of life, right? You start out with the pain and the suffering that people are experiencing in that moment, right? Here are some more things that they've said. I don't find moral persuasion generally works. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, these are, these are important doctrines for us, right, as Christians. But at the same time, interesting to see how pastors really kind of struggle through how do you balance this out with pastoral care. 
Um, here's another pastor who said, my moral objection doesn't mean I'm no longer going to be this person's friend, right? How do I, how do I manage to hang on to these doctrinal, uh, these really important doctrines, but at the same time figure out how to walk with a person as they struggle through some of these things in their lives, right? Okay, so one of the questions I have, though, is where have you heard these doctrines? Where do they get talked about in church, all right? So I would guess that me say, me standing up here saying sanctity of, of life and preservation of the natural course of life, I bet we all have had a sense about these doctrines. But where have you heard them? Where do these things get communicated, especially in a church setting, right? So uh, what, I, what I do want to say is that religion, actually, people who attend religious services regularly, there's, there's lower mortality all across the board, but certainly lower mortality when it comes to suicide, okay? So religion is protective in so many ways. Uh, when it comes to those kind of outcome variables. And, and certainly with, with suicide prevention, why? Because of these moral objections to suicide, right? Sanctity of life, preservation of the natural course of life. These are naturally protective. Why? Because religion has a tendency to shape our beliefs about what it is that we should or shouldn't do, right, as Christians. What does it mean to be a Christian? Can a Christian choose suicide for instance, right? Okay, so um, uh, so by the way, a uh, 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 colleague of mine that Don and Tom know very well, Scott Gibson, Scott Gibson and I wrote a book on preaching hope in darkness and we were talking about how these moral objections have a tendency to show up in a lot of places in church. Moral objections to suicide, reasons for living, and, 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 and how you build a life that's worth hanging on to, worth living, are all things that we hear about in churches. Um, so, so here's my question to you. Where is it that some of these things get communicated in church? So hang on just a sec. Yeah, let me let me pause here. I just had to see what my next slide is. So just 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 talk to the person sitting next to you and talk about where where do these things show up in church? Where have you heard this stuff? This sanctity of life and preservation of the natural course of life. So just talk to somebody sitting next to you. Find someone to talk to. <laughs> Okay, let's see if we if we could draw out some ideas. So where where have you heard this in church? Where have you heard it? I don't know that I have. Okay. Like, that's what we're saying. Okay. You have it. Not explicitly. No. Not explicitly. Yeah. I heard in China in a um at a church that I just was visiting. Yeah. And they have um questions and answers and I was surprised to hear it's a sin to cure yourself in a Christian belief. I was oh, okay. I was uh, surprised to hear that. And oh okay. And it was explicitly stated and you were surprised to hear it yeah. explicitly stated. There's an American um professor teaching in Nanjing and there is in, in the English fellowship. Oh okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, other other folks, where where have you heard this? Because I can tell you, even if it hasn't explicitly been stated, we all know this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a secret. So where, where do we get this? From the Bible. Okay, from the Bible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. What else? Yeah, we were thinking we felt we, we, we have heard it in yeah. sermons, you know, but it's, I don't know that it's, I've heard a sermon just on that topic. That's but right. It's come out sort of around the edges, mixed I'm, in with other material. Around the edges, yeah. right, exactly. So, so by the way, in, in Acts, there's a wonderful suicide prevention story, which is Paul preventing the suicide of the Philippian jailer. And I'm always sitting there in church saying, Say the words suicide <laughs> prevention. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But but we know, we know just by hearing that story get preached about that somehow it was important for Paul to prevent the death of a Philippian jailer, who was probably not a fun guy to hang out with. Right? Probably. And and so we 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 these ideas seep in for us, right? Well, other ideas? We we do hear these ideas around the edge. There's something that just came to mind after Burns, uh, this guy, uh, Dr. Bunger, when I talked was um, Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. Was, um, reading headlines about Catholic Church doctrine. Like, if I read the newspaper, the Catholic Church is very explicit, mm -hmm. and, and it's written out in very clear language. Oh. So give a mortal sin or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll read you the Catholic catechism, catechism yeah. in a few minutes. So, yeah, and we all kind of know that stuff, yeah. don't we? Yeah. But, but I can tell you, this stuff, this, these doctrines seep into worship. They seep into the teachings that we get, either in adult education kind of forums or preaching. So they're, they're the way they, we, we kind of intuitively know this. Yeah. Even if it's not explicitly said. It's in the Ten Commitment. Do not kill. Do not kill. Yeah. Mm. So there, there are certain things in the Bible that seem fairly clear. Yeah, Tom and then. Oh, oh, whenever yeah. we broach the topic of hope, Christian hope. Give it Christian that's hope. That's a celebration yeah. of life. Oh, that's right. Mm. That's right. There's something about something about life being valued by Christians, and we, we kind of know that intuitively, don't we? Yeah. What I was going to say is a little bit to do with that is like you know when when somebody dies in our church family, when we say they've gone to be with the Lord. Yeah. You know, it's like the the idea that there is eternal life and that there is a a something that comes after this. You know, I think people I know who are very secular. You know, the idea of killing yourself is like, well, if, you, if nothing happens afterwards, if it's just lights out, then if you're tired and you're sick of it, then just, you know, it doesn't matter now or later. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, so so we get these messages, right? And, and we all kind of intuitively, even if we've never had those doctrines stated this way, we have this intuitive sense that life is of value, especially if you're a Christian, right? All right, now, uh, I, I had to just find a way to sneak this in here somewhere, so here it is. Be, but I love this quote. This is actually from a Jewish rabbi. So, But this is what he said. He said, by the way, suicide also has a social impact. That actually, just so you, in case you want to know, comes from Aquinas even before this. But, but um, uh, suicide really affects society as well, right? And this is what he said. He, this was in regard to a particular case that we were showing all of our clergy. And he said, you know, the negative impact, if this person chooses to kill themselves, yes. would be an impact on society uh, and on this person's family, on their on the <laughs> sister, because all of that does something to lessen the unshakable value of life. Right, so there's just something about something we, we we know all this stuff somewhat intuitively that there's a strong value for life in our Christian faith, and 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 some of that has to do with the sanctity of life. Some of that has to do with the preservation of the natural course of life. Right. All right. Now, by the way, there's also some of the other things that come out in some of these interviews have to do with. Uh, so I would call sanctity of life and, that, and preservation of the natural course of life moral objections to suicide. 
And I, I, I was presenting at a conference once, and this lady was like, I don't think you should call it that. But you know what? That's kind of what it is, isn't it? Moral objection. It's, it's, it's reasons to not kill yourself, right? But in addition to that, some of the other things that we get from our faith would be something that, that we could also call reasons to live. Right? What are your reasons to live? Not necessarily, okay, this is not such a morally good decision to kill yourself, but also what would be the reasons for a person to stay alive, especially within limiting circumstances, right? So, um, and, and some of the reasons to live that some pastors have told us about are things like what a church does for people. So some of the things that churches do is that uh, they give a, pl a, a place for people to serve, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what one pastor told us. He said, there's a lot of needs in our church and that there's a lot of needs in our community. And I would tell a person who's suicidal, hey, you would have an opportunity to serve in our church. Let me give you an opportunity to serve. That's a reason to live, right? A reason to live is having a community of people that you belong to, and that you contribute to, and, you, and they would notice if you weren't there, right? So uh, another pastor said, you know what I would do for this case that we were presenting called Jacob in this case? I would want to give this person a sense of his worth and dignity and how he can make a contribution in our church, right? So there's something also somewhat intuitive when we think about the value of life that's happening just organically in a church setting, right? Where, where you have a place where you can belong, where you have a place where you can contribute. So those are, those are what we would call reasons to live, right? Now, um, one of the things that we have found, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the part that's in blue, but one of the things that we found is one of the reasons why churches are so important to suicidal people is that gives them a safe, connected community, right? And if you look at the green part, where they have, co congregants have a sense of belonging and mattering, like I matter to this group of people, right? And um, having a, a kind of a culture that just allows for that sense of belonging and that sense of connectedness and, and mattering, right? So, uh, and all of these are what I would call reasons to live. A little bit different from moral objections, but also on that side of life is important, and we're going to support your life. Yeah, the Lord. Along the lines of what you mentioned earlier, too, the reason to live would be the impact on the family system. The, and the impact on the family system, on society. Epigenetics. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so now uh, let me put you back to talking to the person next to you. And you can, you can talk some more about where do you think you've heard a little bit about sanctity of life and preservation of the natural course of life. But where have you found reasons to live in a church? Where have you found ideas in church about how to build a life worth living? Right? Because I think these are also things that happen in churches that whether we know it or not, we're doing suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. So chat with the same person you were chatting with. Where else do we find some of these ideas? This valuing of life. Chat with your neighbor again. <laughs> Yeah. 
For, for us to really connect on a not necessarily one to one, but it, but on a more individual level with uh, with you know if you've got five, six, or you know seven couples who are there, it's an opportunity to really be able to check in with people. Yes, uh, it, and, and you didn't use this word, but kind of more transparently and authentically, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where else? Where else do do we? Find the valuing of life in church. Yeah. Well, if you have a role in church, like you are expected to be the deacon on Sunday morning, or you are, you know, the fifth grade Sunday school teacher, you know, and the kids know you and expecting you to be there, you know, just the like expectation of, you know, people who know you will miss you if you're not there, and you have responsibility to. People depend on me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I matter. To that, those fifth grade students and to the Sunday school program. Yeah. yeah. And as Foker talked about uh, the importance, say, of the gifting that we've each been given, yes. then uh, we see how we fit into the whole yep. package. Of, Which of is the body individual works. and unique mm -hmm. to each person, and each person is necessary mm -hmm. as part of the functioning of the body, right? And That's and certainly a value for life, isn't it? And if we're the priesthood of believers, then each of us has a purpose. Each of us has a ministerial responsibility and privilege. That's right. Um, we're all ministry. Exactly. Yeah, we're all ministry. Yeah. 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 Now, any other thoughts? Yeah. We didn't say this in our group, but would you, would you put hospitality in that category? Oh, yeah. Because that's a non-threatening place. Yeah. Right? You know, when you invite people into your home and you, you, right, you talk about things and it's just, I value you because of who you are. Come and have a meal with me or there have you a go. cup of coffee or whatever. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any kind of that kind of reaching out, right, yeah. is, is showing value for life. Yeah. I think for me as a pastor, equipping people to find their gifts and seeing them released and sent out. Yes. Even if it means physically they leave our church. Yes. Right? That, because you, you, you're giving them a purpose. Right? Yes. The, the hey, purpose. I, I'm called by yep. God and I have to fulfill my vocation. Yeah. And my call. Purpose, meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like somebody else raised their hand. Okay, yeah. I think I think you can just get that um, message message from the sermons and uh, yeah. you know, a lot of the topics that you'll come to as a visitor. You know? Yeah. Mm. And I think some of this gets explicitly stated and some of this gets implicitly implied, doesn't it? Just in, in what we do in the church. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I just thought of is that I've I've noticed more recently, maybe because I'm in my 40s now, but that, you, like, where else, besides unless, you you know, you're maybe your work community, it, like, church is so intergenerational, and so it's yes. your chance to know people from other, you know, ages and life stages and everything, and so in terms of, like, witnessing the natural course of life, you have this kind of, uh, you can see how life plays out, and that's hopeful. Because you see people who are older than you, who yeah. you know, like have there's things to look forward to in that stage, yeah. and you can help people who are younger than you, who yeah. have you know things that you know. Oh, I know what it's like to have a tiny little kid, yeah. and you know, so you know you have a purpose as your generational role. And yeah, the, 
and you see life start and you see life end right. and you see the in between. Yeah. 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 Great point. I don't think it's something that I've thought of before with respect to how to build a life worth living. But wouldn't that be a life that continues in obedience to God's word? I was going to say, as Christians, we just know how to do this, right? How do you build a life worth living? Well, you become closer and closer to Christ. Yeah. Whatever right. our circumstances that's are, what, be obedient to those right. circumstances. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we have, as Christians, we have a, a real template for what that means, don't we? And that's that's unique, and that, that has to do with valuing life because we're teaching people how to have a, a life worth living. Mm -hmm. Not always an easy life, but a life worth living. And, and a, a life beyond ourselves, to please. Yes, beyond ourselves, right. Right, because we're God. serving God, yeah. and the, we're concerned for the welfare of his people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, here's the thing, and we're going to get back to this. Now, one of the things, uh, I, think, I think church organically just keeps screaming in our face the value of life. But why is it that sometimes there are people who are struggling in our pews, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some statistics in a minute, who are struggling with, with you know, wanting to live? What, and, and how do we actually help these people? Well, sometimes one of the things that can get in the way is what, what I call theologically based stigma, right? Because um, I think we deal a lot with some of these ideas in our society, but for, from a Christian standpoint, people really struggle with feeling like their faith is, is a weak faith. If they have, if they're Christian and they have thoughts of suicide, so they, they, they think to themselves, only weak Christians become suicidal, or suicidal thinking is a failure of faith. And 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 as Christians, this doesn't just relate to suicide prevention; it can, uh, you know, relate to any number of challenges that people are facing. But we feel like sometimes in churches that we this this is this is. Uh, this is a pastor who said these words, that's why they're in quotes, that we have to put on a facade, have it all together, and I don't have it up here, but another pastor said, and show up with our shiny, pretty selves. Mm -hmm. Right? And so sometimes I think that's some of what's working against us in churches. I think that's what makes suicide prevention a little challenging. We have riches when we think about the moral objections to suicide, the reasons for living, you know, the ideas around how to build a life worth living, we have this challenge before us. And one of the challenges is some of our ideas around, you know, how is it that Christians even could struggle with wanting to stay alive, all right? And which, which, which results in the fact that sometimes suicidal Christians don't reach out for help in our churches. And it can also mean that sometimes churches aren't ministering to these folks who are, who are actually part of, oftentimes, part of our body. All right, now, I'm going to get back to that, but we're going to take a little detour and do a little theological reflection because that's, that's important when it comes uh, to suicide. Who, who, who was talking about the classical Catholic doctrine? Somebody well, I mean, over I've read it. There we go. There, there we go. Yeah, so we got we to gotta think about this a little bit, all right? Okay, so what I want you to think about is Sally as we go through this theological reflection. So this is an actual case that a happened to a pastor. This was his second day at the church. <laughs> second day at the church. <laughs> Sally calls him up. <laughs> Sally calls him up and says, so of course, her name wasn't Sally, but she calls him up and says, I'm sitting at home with a razor blade next to me, and I don't see any reason to live anymore. Can you imagine? Second day on the job. So, so what we want to do is think theologically about what's going on. What are we going to say to Sally, right? Now, the thing is, 
remember that we're always going to prioritize pastoral care. Sally's suffering, and we need to think about that, right, the pastoral care piece. But in the back of our minds, we're also thinking about moral objections to suicide. What about sanctity of life? What about preservation of the natural course of life for Sally? And what about Sally's reasons to live, since she herself brought those up, right? And how is it that Sally is struggling with building a life worth living, right? Okay, so we're going to come back to Sally in just a little bit. But let's, one, one thing that has surprised me in, in interviewing pastors is that there are actually a variety of views on, on suicide, the theology of suicide. So I'm going to share those with you uh, related to what I've seen. So here's, here's the important thing I want to say. So when we think about suicide and theology, we always think about the theology of suicide. Duh, of course. Is suicide a sin that is going to damn you to hell, right? Or is suicide morally objectionable or morally wrong? But here's, here's the point I'm going to try to make about Sally, all right? The point I'm going to try to make is in church, we have so many other things to talk about besides the theology. We have so many riches besides moral objections to suicide and a theology of suicide. We have a theology of life. How do you build a life worth living, right? What are reasons to live? Theology of death. Are there ever any circumstances that justify laying down your life for someone else? And as Christians, we're going to have to say, yes, there's got to be some situations, right? What about a theology of suffering? Because that's where, that's where Sally is struggling. Sally is struggling because she has lost the joy in her life. And that's where she's struggling. What does that mean that I'm a Christian and I have no joy in my life? And then a theology of community. Can Sally just pull herself out of the church that way? So how, how do we think about some of those things theologically? So I'm going to hang out right here for a few minutes, but I want you to think more broadly, all right? Because, because we have so many riches in the Christian faith that we want to think about as we think about suicide prevention. All right, now this is the thing that was a little bit surprising to me when I started doing interviews, is that there are Christian pastors who believe suicide is not a sin. All right, and, and, and this is from Martin Luther himself, all right? He says, I don't share the opinion that suicides are certainly to be damned. My reason is that they do not wish to kill themselves, but are overcome by the power of the devil. So, you know, he was looking at it from the point of view of diminished moral responsibility, all right? Now, I've talked to other pastors who have said the Bible is silent, on suicide, I'll give you an example in a second. And that silence means that it's not a sin, mm-hmm. all right? So let me give you an example of a Hithophel right here. So a Hithophel, these are the suicides that are mentioned in the Bible, just in case you're wondering how I came up with that list. So a Hithophel was David, King David's advisor, mm-hmm. all right? And do you remember King David's son? Absalom revolted. And so Ahithophel went over to Absalom's side. And Ahithophel gave Absalom all kinds of good advice for how to beat David. Absalom did not follow it. All right, so here's what Ahithophel did. He put his house in order, hanged himself, and was buried in his father's tomb. The Bible never said, oh my goodness, Ahithophel just killed himself, and that's a sin, all right? And, and, and I have had pastors who have said, hey, that silence means that it's not a sin, all right? So that's one view. That's one view. All right, here's my second view. Can you see number two up there? So there are <coughs> pastors, and this is probably, probably more pastors I've talked to are, are going to lean in this direction. So, for instance, Bonhoeffer. Anybody know Bonhoeffer? So Bonhoeffer said, 
Look, the silence of the Bible on uh, when it comes to suicide is not a basis for condoning suicide. All right. Now, uh, the other thing to think about is that, uh, like, say, when Samson visits a prostitute, the Bible doesn't say, oh, my gosh, that's a sin of adultery. Right. So the Bible doesn't always call out, um, hey, that's that's a sin. Right. So that's that's one of thought. The other side is where you the one who said this the 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 sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, right? You shouldn't murder. And whoever sheds the blood of a human, presumably any human, whether it's yourself or someone else, right, is that's that's a sin, right? And and Augustine or Augustine is the one who said since the sixth commandment does not have the qualification, your neighbor. Okay, remember it says you shall not murder. It doesn't say you shall not murder your neighbor, right? Whereas some commandments say that, right? So Augustine said, since it doesn't say your neighbor, it applies both to you and to killing somebody else, all right? So Augustine was... There were others in that era who were talking about the, that, that this applies to suicide, but Augustine is, of course, one of the more well-known, all right? Now, many, many uh, pastors are going to argue for the morality around choosing life, that choosing life is the moral choice to make based on sanctity of life. That's what I've heard over and over again from, from pastors. The natural, the preservation of the natural course of life, clearly we can find that in the Bible, right? In Psalm 139, all the days ordained for me were written in your book. That sense of ordaining the number of days that a person has, right? And Ephesians 5, that we care for our bodies, right? So certainly that that idea of, of preserving your life. Now, most of it, so, so that's the second view. Third view most of us that take the view that suicide is a sin, most pastors that I've talked to will also say that it's forgivable. All right? So here's, here, here's where I want to bring up the Catholic Catechism, okay? In 1992, the Catholic Catechism was changed. And it, it, we, we, most of us just are not aware of that, right? And so this is literal. So it's still a mortal sin. Suicide is still a mortal sin, but this is what the catechism says. Suicide is a sin. And grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish their responsibility. Mm, diminish moral responsibility. And we should not despair of the eternal salvation of people who have taken their lives. Interesting, huh? So we, we always think of this classical Catholic viewpoint, which actually has, has, has been shaped uh, over, over the years. OK? So uh, forgivable, a mortal sin, but potentially forgivable. All right, now, uh, from a Protestant perspective, a lot of Protestants are going to argue, hey, in the lists of sins in the Bible, murder isn't called out as a different kind of a sin. Suicide isn't mentioned in those lists, right? And, and there's no clarity around what does that mean, the unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the, the Holy Spirit, or the sin unto death. There isn't clarity that this refers to suicide. So most Protestants are going to argue that, that this is a sin like other sins. So here's, here's another perspective, and this is a perspective. This is from Lewis Meads, who was an ethicist, had, has since passed on. I don't, anybody heard of Lewis Meads? All right, yeah, he was kind of a powerhouse a few years ago, but, but not quite so much anymore. But you can find these, this perspective in a number of, of, of uh, Protestant thinkers, uh, theological thinkers, all right? But this is what Lewis Smith said. He said, all of us commit sins that were too, because the, the argument is, but you can't repent of it, right? Suicide, you can't repent of it, right? This is what Lewis Smith said. 
But all of us commit sins that were too spiritually cloddish to recognize for the sins that they are. And we all die with sins not named and repented of. All right? And so how, how do we think about this from a Protestant perspective? Well, we think about it covenantally, right? That we're in a covenantal relationship with God as opposed to a transactional relationship where every sin needs to be repented of and forgiven by God. So that, um, and, and, and why is that? Part of it is that covenantal piece and part of it is, you know, we, we have verses in the Bible, many, many verses in the Bible where it says that God deals with our sin not as we deserve, right? He's a, he's a friend of sinners. He's a fair judge. So, you know, Protestants are going to, many, many Protestant clergy are going to lean on the side of it's a sin not, and it is forgivable. Now, by the way, there are folks, this is just an example from David Wilkerson, who was started Teen Challenge, I think, who said, you know, the Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and to destroy that is to blaspheme. It's the unpardonable sin. So, um, you know, and even from kind of a more sort of Wesleyan Arminian perspective, so a classical Calvinist might argue that a Christian uh, who dies by suicide would remain secure in salvation, but even from a Wesleyan Arminian approach, that some of those folks might argue that suicide results in a person um, uh, committing the sin of apostasy, right? Which, 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 which could result in the sin not being forgiven by God. But even Wesley himself, and this is a quote from Stephen Harper, who wrote about. Um, the four views uh, said he Wesley himself could hardly believe the possibility that that a person would lose their salvation. All right, so so there are these four different views that keep keep surfacing as I talk to pastors around this issue of of suicide prevention. So um, my perspective is, as I said, there I think we we all have a tendency to hang out over here around the theology of suicide. And I think one of my concerns is if we, um, it, it, some of the moral objections around suicide have to do with this theology of suicide. I think as we think about how to talk to people around this issue, sanctity of life, preservation of the natural course of life are so important. But what about reasons to live? What about a theology of life? What about how you build a life worth living? Not just theology of life, but also theology of suffering. How do you build a life worth living in the midst of suffering? How do you maintain your Christian hope in those situations? How, how does community help you manage your way through some of these challenging life circumstances, right? So my perspective is we need to think about this theologically, but we need to also step back and realize that the church and the Bible have riches galore when it comes to thinking about why should a person choose life, right? Why should they? Why should they, especially as a, as a Christian? All right, so turn to your neighbor. And talk about Sally. Talk about Sally. So Sally calls you up and says, look, I'm sitting at home with a razor blade next to me, and I don't see any reason to live anymore. What are you going to say or do for Sally? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the 
depends on whether you so want to share it. And sometimes you just sit with that person and the All right, so what what were some of your thoughts? What um, what do you think about what do you think about what are you gonna say to Zach? Right. Well, the, the first thing she said, I don't see a reason to live anymore. The, the first place I would start with is reasons to live. Oh, okay. And uh, then, like, like what? Well, uh, it's a gift. Yeah. <laughs> Your life is a gift. And that may start going into the theological component. Okay. But also you, you have something to give others, which would spill over into uh, how to build a life worth living. Oh, so. okay. So how, how, could we, how could we help you find your place in the church where you can contribute and find meaning? Yeah, what else? Someone on this side. Well, she obviously wants to talk. She wants to talk. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, so you, you. you talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About whatever, whatever, whatever it is that she wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, T tell me what's going on, Sally. Like, mm -hmm. like, wow, this is, this is, it. Like, what's going on? Tell me more. Mm -hmm. What else? What other ideas do you have? I think just the keeping her talking, building that relationship, making those connections. Yep. Um, and, and it was suggested, you know, offering, if you're comfortable, you know, let's stay on the phone, but can I come to you? Can I visit? Can we get together? So then you take the, the you take that separation out and you bring it close together so that okay. you have direct contact yeah. to feel grounded. Yeah. Is anybody else at home with her? A anybody else at home with you, Sally? And, you know, yeah, and, and I can keep talking. Um, uh, uh, this, this isn't what I would do with Sally, but this is my moment to say it. So 988 is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, all right? So tuck it away. 988. Anybody can call it. Sally can call it. You can call it. Sally's friend can call it. Anybody can. Yep. So I'm a nurse. Yep. And I was trained. Yep. When somebody says, I'm going to commit suicide, you ask very direct questions. Is that razor blade near you? Could you please put it, could you slide it across the table for me and I'm coming right over or I'm calling 911? Because in my mind, it's like somebody said, my legs were just cut off and I'm bleeding all over the floor yeah. and um, quarts of blood are leaving my body. You need to have that shored up, stopped, and get some medical assistance. Yeah. So in my mind... It's ex exceedingly practical. I would not, with somebody calling me like that, I would not be saying, well, don't you, didn't you like being a deacon? Wasn't that a good time? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's not what would hurt me. But, but, I, but again, I have a very particular view as a nurse. And I've had the opportunity to have my best friend call me when I was at work, telling me that she was going to. And, and the first question, she didn't say she had a razor blade. She said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, and so the first question a nurse is taught to say what, is, what do you mean? What are you going to, well, tell me more. What, yeah. what are you going to do? And she said, it's winter time. I'm going to drive my car into a tree because nobody would suspect that I commit suicide. They thought I would slide. I said, yeah. got it. 
And then I said, and this was before cell phones, I called a friend that lived in Framingham. I, I wrote on a piece of paper to my colleague, call Janice and have Janice drive over there and I'll keep I'll her keep on the talking. phone. And because she had a plan. Yeah. If she said, oh, I don't know, maybe I won't wake up in a week or something, then I would have been, I would be able to drive home and go to fix right. my friend. But in that right. moment, she said she had a plan. I was like, oh, this is very interesting. And everything was about separating her from her car, her yep. plan, and getting her help. And so I, I don't, I, so I'm so clinical about it. I don't have any, <laughs> well, I wouldn't do any of it. Well, I'm, I'm totally with you on the clinical part here. But here's, here's how I like to think about it. Here's how I like to think about it, Alan. So um, I, I grew up in France. I'm always thinking about that. It's <laughs> always in the back of my mind. So, you know, but it's different from just kind of dreaming about it. Like, uh, someday I'm going to go to France. As opposed to, I'm going next summer to, I buy the tickets. All right. So one of the things I'm always trying to figure out is, did Sally buy the tickets? Yeah. That's what you were trying to figure out with your friend. Right? So, so I, I... By the way, the reason this isn't in the slide deck is I had it in there just in case somebody asked me that question. But, you know, we could sit here and talk till the cows come home about all of the different kind of situations. What are you going to do? So that's why I want to tell you 988 is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're wondering what to do and you're not sure, you can call that number, mm -hmm. and you can get some help. And you could kind of ferret your way through, what am I going to do about Sally? Is, has Sally bought the tickets, or is she just kind of dreaming, about, dreaming about, like, ah, this was such a hard day. I don't know how I'm going to get through it, right? So very definitely, there are there's so much more we could talk about when it comes to um, you know, kind of like, as you're saying, that clinical kind of a piece. Well, okay, there we go. We it decided to, to move. So, so, um, so let me switch gears, though, because you definitely do want to have that on your radar. And if you have a sense that Sally has bought those tickets, you do want to be calling that phone number, 988, right? It's, it just switched in July to 988, so is it's 988 easy to... Is 988 going to dispense an, an ambulance? I'm, I'm being... No. So that's one more thing. So it's no. support for me? No. Oh, it's for a, a suicidal person can call it. No, no, no. But, but in this scenario, I'm on the phone with Sally. I'm going to say, I'll be right with you and call 988. That's what I'm trying to figure out what you're... Yeah. You know what I would do? No. I would, I would uh, conference... I would... If I'm talking to Sally, I'd conference in 988. Yeah, I'd say, Sally... Boy, I'm kind of at the end of my rope here. I don't really know, you know, what the next best step is here. But I know somebody who can help us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be 988, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. So, Sally, I, I might not even ask Sally if that's okay, because I don't want to know if it's okay or not with her. I'm just going to say, Sally, I'm going to conference in 988. Let's ask them. See, see what they have to say. So where 98 brings you, by the way, there's like 160 different crisis centers across the United States. You're patched into your local crisis center. So we're patched in, I don't know about you guys, but in the North Shore, we're patched into Samaritans, uh, you know, up in, uh, you know, like Merrimack Valley, like, um, uh, like Lawrence area. All right, that's where we're patched in. And uh, so they know our local resources. Every, uh, I mean, uh, we, as I said, we could, we could talk about this until the cows come home, but, but what I want to talk about is what does it mean as a church to do suicide prevention? But if, if you bump into this, just kind of know that they're also in Massachusetts. Every county has its own psychiatric services that you can call, and that's, Apart from 988, that's who you want to be calling. But, but 988 will know all of that. So 988 is all you have to remember. 
As opposed to 911? As opposed to 911. Okay. Yeah. 911 is going to get you to the police. Yeah. Okay. We don't necessarily, we don't know if Sally has bought the tickets. Okay. So you would call 911 if she was, she said, I have cut my wrist and I'm bleeding yeah. all over the floor. You would call 911 in that case. But because we don't really know, that's why you want to think about 988. Yeah. All right, so why think theologically about this? All right, so one of the reasons is going back to what I was saying earlier, that there's this theological, su uh, theological stigma around suicide. And why is it important for us to think about this theologically? Because most likely there are suicidal Christians in your church. So this is um, a suicide preventionist uh, named uh, uh, Faye Avis who says, on a this is his... his, his uh, estimation. He says he estimates on average about 30 adults and then more adolescents than that in the congregation of 500 are thinking about their own suicide on any given Sunday. That's his estimation, which would be about 6%. In one study we did of congregants, different kind of congregants in different parts of the United States, 11% of those people had current suicidal thinking. All right. So one of the things that this research has started helping me realize is, you know what? These folks are sitting in the pews right next to me, right next to you, and they're trying to make sense out of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And they might not be reaching out for help because of that, because of that theologically based uh, stigma. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, one thing, and then I'm going to get to you. So one of the things that has come up in two studies that we've done with a pretty large number of clergy, like this one had 801 Catholic, uh, Jewish, and Protestant clergy, they, they consistently report that about two people per year reach out to them for help. I would estimate there should be more. And so my question is, why not? Why not? You know, the church has so much to offer. We are full of riches for people who are struggling with staying alive. Why are these folks, why are more of them not reaching out for help? Right? I was just curious if, if I mean, to, to have suicidal ideation or, you know, do you need to be depressed? I mean, are they, are they the same thing or are they, you know... Do you have to have one for the other, or you know? Huge debate in the suicide prevention field, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, but about half the suicide prevention field are going to say, you know, these people have lives that are not worth living for a whole variety of reasons, right? Maybe they just were sued and lost all their money, and um, you know, something about their life isn't working. And, and then the other half are going to say no, suicide prevention clearly rests in the realm of <coughs> mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, Eric, there's a bit of a debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so, uh, you know, I'm guessing that stigma has something to do with it. That's probably not the whole story, but it <coughs> probably has something to do with it, right? So. Turn to your neighbor and talk about what kind of stories do you tell yourself about suicide? If that feels just a little bit vulnerable, what, what do you, you know, you can talk about other people, right, instead of yourself. But, you know, in general, what do people tell themselves about suicide? What do people in general tell themselves about suicidal Christians? And how do you think that affects suicidal Christians? So go ahead, talk to your neighbor about this. Mm -hmm. 
On the eleven percent. Let's see. When did we do that? Twenty eighteen. Yeah. Which means we did it in twenty seventeen. Yeah. So what what thoughts did you have about stories? Uh, and, and and let's talk about your friend. What would your friend maybe say about you know what stories do we tell ourselves about suicidal Christians in particular? What kind of stories? I, I can tell you, I've had my own stories about it, and I didn't think they existed until I started doing this research. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just was asking you to repeat the question. Oh, okay. What? Yeah. <laughs> Rat! I got you going to answer my question. <laughs> what beliefs or attitudes do you have about suicidal Christians? What stories do we tell ourselves about suicidal Christians? Yeah. I mean, I think of Jeremiah, I think of Job. That was <laughs> my grid, like that. They're, they're driven to such despair yeah. in their circumstances that and they add, even curse the day they were born. Right? Yeah, like, and add Elijah, Jonah, and, and Moses. Yeah. Add those people, yeah. right? Who said, God, just take my life, right? And, and so I, I think of that, the instilling empathy and, and, and identification yeah. that the, the Word of God has a response to that yeah. feeling of suicide. Yeah. And you should not feel guilty about that. You should yeah. express mm -hmm. these emotions mm -hmm. and identify with Job and Jonah mm -hmm. and all these guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That's how I, the, the belief mm -hmm. about suicidal Christians, yeah. join the club. Right? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Elijah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what, what? I'm just curious what you think about, um, like, because I think it was the Martin Luther quote that said yeah. something about, like, evil. Like, right. Satan. Like evil. Who's, who's roaring like a lion and looking for ways to destroy us. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a great way to destroy us? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I, I can think of three examples off the top of my head of people who seemed fine and all of a sudden and, and then it was so out of the blue shocking to everyone yeah. and then the only explanation that their Christian parents all three of them could come up with was possessed by evil mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. only that's the only thing that makes sense to us well and certainly Martin Luther believed that yeah right so what, like what do you think about that mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think, that I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think Satan is out to destroy us, and Satan does it in a whole lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And there are some really obvious ways, like mm -hmm. telling a person they should kill themselves because they're not 
a beloved child of God because they're not made in the image of God because God doesn't seem to be rejoicing over them. I mean, there's all kinds of wrong beliefs that people have about who they are and their identity that are lies from Satan. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that adds up to um, uh, uh, a situation where Christians think about killing themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? Or that that it's hopeless. Yeah. That, you know, God is not going to intervene in this horrible situation. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand it one minute longer. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think of Job as being a great example of an infusion of hope. Yeah. Because he had a multitude of reasons to, pull, to want to pull the plug. Right. And yet... He persevered, and right. we were able to see that the story turned around dramatically. And they had a great And with each one of us, that hope prevails. Yes. And so the individual that has the razor blade, yep. tomorrow may look incredibly different. Mm -hmm. But what's going on today that would give you some reason to push through it? That's right. By the way, the 98 website, the... A Suicide in Crisis Lifeline, great website, has some wonderful stories of hope for people who are struggling with suicide. Mm -hmm. and, and there are videos about people exactly mm -hmm. like what you're describing, Dolores. So yeah. I, I think we don't, I think of shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. right? we, we don't have a culture, and in, even in you know, life group or churches, it's very hard to talk about sin. You can say, okay, so we're going to call it sin. It's, forget that label. It's hard to say, I'm feeling really insecure about my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I feel, so we don't have a tendency to be transparent and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we create that atmosphere, mm -hmm. then these that are sitting next to us, we're going to be able to identify. I want to be able to identify somebody yeah. uh, who doesn't have any symptoms. Yeah. But then, as you were saying, Becky, then all of a sudden they take their life. Like I, I'd like to be able to prevent that by being, so how do you do that in a church? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you read my next slide or something like that? So, so here's the thing. By the way, here's the book that's about to come out. But um, so the thing is, is that uh, one of the things that we found just doing interviews with a lot of congregants and suicide preventionists and clergy is, People are more likely to reach out for help when the church fosters this culture of transparent authenticity where no one needs to present. Here it is, their shiny, pretty selves. That's a quote from a pastor, right, at church, or where they can present warts and all, right? Because we're all human. We all have the warts, you know? We're all trying to present ourselves as well as we can. But at the same time, there's a, there's a price for that, isn't there? And the price for that is that people want, might not reach out for help when they need to, right? Now, by the way, some, I, just to, to circle back, some people, even in, a, in that kind of a, of, a, of a church, might not reach out for help. So I don't want to suggest that, you know, the, those were those kind of situations. But if we don't have that practice in our churches, these suicidal congregants are going to be less likely to reach out for help, right? Because of that, that stigma, right, around being suicidal. All right, one of my, uh, before I tell you about my great hero, Blind Bartimaeus, I also just want to say, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Genesis 50, you know, where Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about the Christian hope. Mm -hmm. Right? But here's my other hero. So, uh, <laughs> apart from Joseph, here's my other one. So, blind Bartimaeus was in a, a society where people did not practice uh, transparent authenticity. Right? He, he was saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody was like, shh, shh. That's kind of what we do in church, right? Some, that's what we do. But at the same time, Blind Bartimaeus blind Bart just shouted louder. That's why he's my hero. And you know, not everybody reaches out for help. 
blind Bartimaeus has led the way for us here in this situation, right? Now, one idea is that some churches, uh, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention Faith Communities Task Force, that's a bit of a mouthful, but, but they, they have what's called the weekend of prayer. And you can actually just pray for people who have been touched by suicide, whether it's suicidal people or people who have lost a loved one to suicide. You can actually just pray for them. And there's uh, last year, it was this weekend. Why? Because, you know, Muslims and Jewish folks might, might um, ha have a different day, a different sacred day than Christians. That's why it's a range of days here. But that's one idea. That's one way to start creating some of that open, transparent authenticity. But here's another way. So I asked my friend, Dr. Scott Gibson, another good friend of ours, uh, how do churches do this? Like, how do they do this? Get that transparent authenticity. That is tough to do. Uh, you know, and so this is what he said. He said, he called it a deep community. He said a deep community is a church that understands hurt and pain. And, 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 and I would say the, the sin of the world that surrounds us, right? The brokenness of the world that surrounds us. And a church that understands that people struggle is a church that is going to be able to foster that kind of transparent authenticity. And I always think about that Romans 8 verse. The whole creation has been groaning. And on some level, as a church, that's what we do. We groan with everybody else who's groaning, right? We mourn with those who mourn. And, and alongside of broken creation, we ourselves are broken as well, right? And we recognize that. Here's another idea. This is from the, the, the Lutheran church on Route 1. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great, great interview with the pastor, and this is what he said. Uh, he said, I almost, by the way, um, uh, survivors of suicide, that means family members of people who have died by suicide, prefer the word died by suicide rather than committed suicide because mm -hmm. it's no longer a crime. It used to be a crime up until recently, mm -hmm. but no longer. So uh, he says, I almost committed suicide. I'd say I almost died by suicide when I was 21 years old, and I'm not shy about sharing that experience. I've been transparent, and others have been transparent in the hope that if that's where someone is, that they would feel comfortable bringing it up, thinking, hey, I'm not the only one. That's another idea, right? So there are different ideas for how churches foster that kind of transparent authenticity. So it might be just praying for people who are touched by suicide once a year. That's the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention suggestion. It could be ha having folks share their own story, right? It could be, um, I forgot what the, oh, it could be just recognizing, hey, we're all groaning, right? We're all groaning in some way. All right. So uh, just talk to your neighbor. How would you, how would you at this church signal that you're willing to help suicidal Christians? But by the way, can I also just append, if you're creating that transparent authenticity around suicidal behaviors, you're doing it for everything else too. Like, oh my goodness, I'm struggling with being a parent. Oh my goodness, I'm struggling with, you know, this court case that I'm involved in. Or, oh my goodness, I'm struggling with, you know, I committed a crime and I don't even know how to talk about it. So there are all kinds of ways that we as broken people are struggling that transparent authenticity can, can help in fostering that kind of community where people can reach out for help. So, Just very quick before we discuss that. Uh, transparent authenticity from the top yes. is usually, and this gentleman over here is very good about that I, during his messages. I am that we not hear, surprised uh, to hear that. Um, that he's not perfect. Not and, surprised uh, to I hear I think that's the big first step to uh, 
broadening it out beyond suicide. Ab absolutely. And it just encompasses everything, right? It encompasses it. It creates a, a kind of a culture where people can reach out for help for a lot of reasons. And not be judged. And not be judged. Exactly. And not be judged. Thank you for yeah. saying that. Yeah. All right. So talk with your neighbor. How, how could your church signal that you're willing to help suicidal Christians or other people who are struggling? By the way, I just put up a whole list of trainings, mostly because of the question about what if the person is like bleeding on the floor, what do you do? There's a lot of great faith-based trainings on suicide prevention, but what I would call what we're talking about here is suicide intervention. What we've been talking about tonight is suicide prevention, right? How do we prevent this in the first place? Suicide intervention, a lot of great faith-based training. So I'm just going to put them up here in case you're, in case you're interested in, in those. But what are some of your ideas about how to signal safety? This is a safe place to tell me that you're struggling with suicidal thoughts. What, what kind of ideas? And you said somebody's got to go first. <laughs> yeah, say that. Say that. Well, we were talking about, you know, if everybody looks like their life is all put together and everybody's doing great, and you know, you talk at coffee hour and everybody says, oh, I'm great, yeah, you're great, oh, great, great. <laughs> um, then you, and I specialize in telling everybody that I'm not great. So like, you know, I think that it's like sometimes you have to be the one to say like, eh, I don't know, like this week kind of stunk and yeah. I'm gonna tell you about it, you know? So it's like, you have to be willing to be the person maybe the you don't know person. what who you're talking to. You don't know what's going on with them. Right. So if you are willing to be vulnerable and say something, right. they might too. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I like yeah. the word being transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like just being mm -hmm. real and who you are. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to manufacture. Yeah. Well, that like picture when you said you have a community <laughs> coming around a suicidal person. It's like 95 people who are bright and shiny, whatever you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of those people are infertile. Some of those people are are painfully single. Some of those people have stolen money from their boss. Some of those people, like all those 95 people, aren't they? Might not be suicidal, but they're struggling with something. And you know, we're all we, we all have something that 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 we've been awake at night crying about. That's Every right. single person in the world. That's right. That's right. 
That's right. And every single person, whether or not they're a Christian, yeah. there's everybody's happy when a baby's born. Why? Because we're all created in God's image. We all want life. Yeah. We all want a, a long, happy life for everybody. Yeah. Nobody's sad at a baby being born. Somebody somebody's happy that that baby was born, right? You know, so there's just there's an inborn desire for life and beauty and longevity that we all have and sometimes it gets lost and covered up with mm -hmm. schmuck. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Life life it can be hard, can't it? I still want to share her ideas about um, hosting a, a community day like outside of church and just probably working with a town and having an event where everybody can come and, um, and feel welcome and connected okay. also about the awareness of this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice. What, one more idea and then we're out of time. What's another idea? How do we create that, that safety? I would only echo the transparency. I, I mean, our pastor does not like to hear it, but transparency from the top about fallen nature. All of us have fallen psychologies, temperaments, instincts. We're all groaning. Um, we could all do better, and we shouldn't shoulder him with the burden of being the only one. To there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Coffee hour is a great time to say, mm -hmm. I'm not okay. Yeah. yeah. We should all hear that more often. Or, more. or small group. And why? Yeah. Because small group is sure. strong enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if coffee were strong enough, I'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh small group is great. We can make <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, I've very much enjoyed having this conversation with you. We've been traveling a little bit of road from safety of life to suicide prevention, but thanks for letting me uh, be part of your evening. And let me just ask God's blessing on you. Yeah. Father, I just ask your blessing on these people who are uh, here because they uh, want to honor you, to glorify you, to uh, especially to help the people who are around them. And Father, just um, uh, prepare them to the, do that work that you are calling them to do. So God, just be with them, walk with them, mm -hmm. uh, prepare them, uh, strengthen them in all the ways they need to be strengthened, help them to get the skills they need. Uh, Father, just bless them on this journey as they're really thinking through sanctity of life issues. Bless this church, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.